Guyana held an election in 2011. The ruling People's Progressive Party won the presidency with the highest percentage of votes cast among the political parties. However, because of the Guyana's unique constitution, unlike any other country in English-speaking Caribbean, two opposition parties were able, with their combined votes, to win one seat majority in the parliament. A new and uncharted part of governance in Guyana has been initiated. Parliament has to approve the budget. Will the opposition parties do this and on what conditions? Will there be a political constitutional crisis? Can it be resolved with a snap election? We will explore this and other options facing the political leadership in Guyana. Stay tuned, Carib Nation is up next. To all those who give birth to, homes to, or just give thought to people adopted as infants, thanks for considering adoption. Guyana is a country located in South America, but it's always been considered an integral part of the Caribbean. Guyana was colonized by the British, and when the British left in 1966, Guyana had its own constitution as an independent country. Over the years, the constitutions have suffered various changes and reforms. And recently, with the constitution that exists in Guyana, the president of Guyana was elected from one political party. And the parliament, when the two opposition parties combined their, their seats and their votes, they were able to get a one-seat majority. And now this places Guyana in a very unique situation, very different from other English-speaking Caribbean countries, in the sense that you have a president belonging to one party with executive powers, and you have a parliament that has to approve the budget belonging to two political parties. The only comparable, perhaps, example of that kind of shared governance is perhaps the United States of America. But we are going to get into all that because today we have in our studio here in Carib Nation three very distinguished guests. We have on my right here Mr. Gabriel Christian. Gabriel is an attorney of law. He hails from Dominica. And he's a very active gentleman in the research and policy lobbying community for the Caribbean here in Washington, D.C. And next to him is my dear friend, Mr. Ron Allert. Mr. Allert is a president of an accountancy consultancy firm in Washington, D.C. and a political activist in the community also. And next to him is Mr. Errol Archer, a well-known community activist who I have known since 1979 here in Washington, D.C. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you. Now, we are going to talk a bit about Guyana, its constitution, and whether there is a constitutional political crisis looming in the air. But, Gabriel, you are not from Guyana. You are from Dominica. Tell us a little bit first about your constitution very briefly. What do you, how do you label your constitution? Is it a monarchial, a presidential? Uh, is it a British Westminster model kind of constitution? Dominica follows the Westminster parliamentary model, but what happened at independence is the uh, Prime Minister then, Patrick John, opted for Republican status. But the uh, President simply replaced uh, what would have been the Governor General had we remained a monarchy like in Jamaica or Barbados. 
So the president of Dominic is appointed really by the uh, party which holds the majority in parliament. The party which holds the majority in parliament, as in Britain, appoints the prime minister. The prime minister comes from that party. And the party, of course, which won less votes, occupies the, occup the, the, the opposition bench. Just and like in Britain. Exactly. When you see question time, it's exactly. a bit like that. Absolutely. The Prime Minister goes to Parliament. Goes to Parliament, questions. and you have a Speaker of the House who tries to maintain the balance. The Speaker is also um, put in place by the majority party. By, but, that's very important. Yes. By who the elects your Speaker? The majority party does. The majority party. But with the uh, advice and uh, recommendation. There, there's always this effort of inclusion. But be advised, unlike Guyana, where you have an executive presidency, in Dominica, the president is like the governor general. He's basically a, 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 a figurehead in a sense. He represents the state and has primarily a ceremonial function. Okay. The executive function, the real power, is in the hands of the prime minister. Okay, we're going to shift now, Ronan and Errol. We're going to talk a bit. You guys are going to tell us a bit about Guyana. Now, in 1906, the Guyana became politically independent, and we had a monarchical uh, constitution. Uh, it was an exported constitution from Britain. Now, by 1970, the ruling party then was the People's National Congress <coughs> on the leadership of Forbes Bonham, and he reformed that constitution and declared Guyana a republic with a constitutional president, like we have in Trinidad and Tobago, and India with an executive prime minister. But Ron and uh, Errol, in 1980, Forbes Burnham was known to be a guy who decided that he is going to be establish a totalitarian system in Guyana. And there was a referendum in 1980 for a new constitution. Some called it socialist, some called it totalitarian, some called it Burnham's constitution. Tell us a bit of what happened in 1980 with that referendum, that constitution, so that we could fast, fast forward to now. The pre-independence constitution, or the one that was handed to Guyana by the British, um, Barnum felt that he had outgrown that. It did not give him the powers that he needed to govern, um, to have his agenda implemented. Um, he wanted total control, as you, you use the word totalitarian. That previous constitution did not allow for that. So he set about to develop one that uh, gave him total control of the country. He could not, just some key elements of that constitution, he could not have been removed from office. He could not have been impeached. Um, should an impeachment movement start, he had the authority to dissolve the parliament before any action was taken. So he gave himself total control of the country in that way. So that was essentially, in a nutshell, that was the difference between uh, the previous constitution and the one that he put forward. There. Now, B Burnham ruled the country and the People's National Congress until 1992. And the, the opposition that emerged with the People's Progressive Party, which is the original traditional party, Ghana, they had criticized that referendum as fraudulent, and they had promised all the political parties that they will carry out radical constitutional reform. What kind of reforms occurred during that time? Well, there are three elements in the Guyana Constitution, which is different from any of the Westminster-type constitutions throughout the Caribbean and even the whole Commonwealth. One is that you have the executive president who is um, elected on, in, with a polarity of votes, as in the case as what has just happened in Guyana. Secondly, the executive president does not sit in parliament. He's outside of parliament. And the third and most essential thing is that he appoints a cabinet. That is answerable to him. That was the essence of what the Bornham Constitution is. So it was like a kind of um, paramountcy of the presidency? Paramountcy of the presidency, paramountcy of the party. Of the party. And I'm glad you brought the question up of the PVP government criticizing that constitution because what occurred after then is that when they got in there, they realized that, oops, this is great for us to use. There were some reforms 
during about three or four years. They, they it had some reforms. Tinkering of it, I would say. But essentially, it remained a situation where you had the supremacy of the presidency in the constitution entrenched and the party paramountcy. That's right. Correct? That is correct. So what happened now in the last election in 2011 mm -hmm. that has created the present situation where there is a, a division between the parliament and the executive? What happened? Well, a combination of the APNU and the AFC. Explain that APNU is essentially the People's National People's Congress, PNC. the Working People's the Alliance, and some other small parties that are not well known. Right. But fundamentally, it's the former PNC party. It's the former party. PNC party. Okay, of Mr. Burnham. A combined <coughs> electoral majority was created in Parliament with the AFC and the PNC by just one seat. Now, what has happened since then is that the PPP has realized that they cannot run, run through Parliament all the, the, the sort of atrocities and the things, the corruption and what they have been involved with. They can't do that anymore because they're now answerable to Parliament. Parliament should have always and should in any country be the supreme authority of any country. The PPP government wants to make sure that, that those powers are abrogated and more or less sent back or centralized to the presidency. And that's where I think you're having a great deal of problem. So in the opposition, we have two parties. That's right. The AFC, which is the Alliance for, for Change. Change, and the APNU, which is fundamentally, originally the PNC with some other parties. That's correct. And we, they are in parliament as with a one-seat majority. The one-seat majority. And you have in the presidency the ruling People's Progressive Party with the president, Donald Ramutar. Is that correct? That is correct. OK. Errol, how do you, do you read it the way Ron has read it? Uh, what has happened in the 2011 elections? Well, first of all, just to go back a little bit, um, the current constitution that we have, um, the previous constitution had to be um, disbanded. Okay, it had to be changed significantly. And all parties agreed to that. Now, it must be remembered that the PPP and the PNC collectively, historically, gain about 90% of the votes in Guyana. Smaller parties might come in, you know, with 7 or 8% or whatever. Um, so this new constitution was agreed to by the PPP and the PNC, right? So it was a constitution that allowed for uh, uh, an autocratic administration. And that was well in line with both the PPP and the PNC. It allowed them control, for example, the voters, uh, sorry, the, the, the list of representatives. Each party appoints uh, its representatives to the House, and those representatives cannot um, deviate from the party line. Should they do that, they would be immediately recalled. Okay, so, so we need to understand that, that both parties found this constitution very, very uh, uh, good for them. And it could not have been put in place without the support of both of them. Well, I think it's very important and it's good for Guyana that this is happening because uh, when, when uh, my colleagues here spoke to the issue of the authoritarian constitution, it, it, it essentially meant that we had a diminution in rule of law in Guyana. That is, the president could act in a unilateral way without referring to the parliament. Now, that was fine as long as the PPP uh, was in the was seat of the president and the National Assembly. Now, with the opposition in control of the National Assembly, the president is now compelled to sit down across the table and negotiate with the opposition. Now, this is exactly what Westminster really, uh, from the earlier rights of man process going back to the 1600s, parliament was seen as the voice of the people. That entity that provided checks and balances that cabinet was not a law unto itself, but it was, in fact, accountable to parliament. So there was a public accounts committee. Uh, there were commissions of inquiry. The prime minister would have to account to parliament for his visits and for expenditure. So in Guyana now, the president, though he controls cabinet, does not have the public purse. He has to refer under the Guyanese constitution to the, uh, uh, the committees in parliament 
in way of spending decisions. What that, what, what that, is, that has the effect of doing for Guyana is enforcing a certain balance of power that will defang or take away from the sort of authoritarian presidential system that had evolved with Burnham. And as I think you mentioned, the PPP liked it sufficiently that when it got in, it decided That's to keep right. it. So I think it's a good development. And just to conclude, in your constitution, the president who is an executive president, a working president, not a ceremonial one as in Dominica, is immune from prosecution. prosecution. That is, to me, something that I, when I found that out, uh, really, you know, kind of different from, from all of the islands. The, the prime minister of Dominica was just sued recently for being a French citizen when he went up for election. Uh, the case is going up on appeal. I believe that public servants ought not to be placed in the position of immunity from being sued by those they, whom they serve. Uh, I think President Hoyt sued the uh, Catholic uh, newspaper. Catholic Standard. Catholic yeah. Standard. So if the president can sue a newspaper for libel. And so did, so did uh, the previous, pre the past president sued um, Freddie Kisun for saying that he was King Kong. Well, so it, it, should, it should go both ways. But Kisun couldn't sue the president. Well, Kisun couldn't sue the president. <laughs> exactly. So Anyhow, getting back so, to <coughs> the reality that we are facing now in Guyana, to when the government, when the president came to office, he announced a new doctrine called tripartism, where he invited both the AFC leader and the APNU to talks so that they could, in the context of what you are speaking about, in Christian, in terms of a new kind of political culture, that they will have to work things out. Because if they go into the old mode of the Westminster model, that an opposition is there to oppose, expose, and depose, then it means that there is going to be political turbulence and instability. Now, how do you two of you believe these tripartite talks have been going? And do you all believe that the opposition will approve the budget? Well, they will have to. Um, this is not, uh, there is no constitutional crisis down there. Now, one of the quirks of the Guyanese constitution is that these two parties, that is the opposition parties, could not have come together to form a government. The constitution specifically states that um, the, the, the party that wins the most votes gets the presidency. Um, the only way that could have happened was if they had come together before, they could have coalesced before the election and go in as, as one party. Uh, in that case, uh, the PNC, would, sorry, the PPP would have been in opposition now. But be that as that it is may, assuming uh, that they would have won. That, I'm, I'm assuming if the, election, if the results had come out the it's same. It's not an automatic. But it is not. Uh, okay. I, I'm not saying given, okay, okay. given the results. I, I travel right? with you. Uh -huh. Come on, let's right? go. Um, uh, the two parties could have formed a government, as happened in 1964. Right when uh, the British engineered uh, uh, the defeat of the, um, the PPP. Um, but there is no constitutional crisis now. The tripartite talks, there might be some hiccups here and there, but Obama in this country. If there is not a constitutional a crisis, how is it that the government has taken uh, the matter to court for the judiciary to no, decide whether that the That has always happened. In, in democracies, uh, 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 fulfilling no, the, in democracies the laws that the happens country. all the time. Um, all parties don't see eye to eye on constitutional matters, uh, whether civic society or political parties. And the, uh, sorry, the Supreme Court in the United States here has had to rule on numerous occasions on constitutional matters. What do you believe is going to be the role of the AFC and the APNU in Parliament regarding the budget? Were they correct in, in controlling the committees? What well, is your opinion? Well, well first, of all, first of all, the when the, in every one of these parliamentary democracies that we, can, that we know in the Westminster size, um, style government, parliament is always supreme. Parliament, in essence, even in Dominica, yes, it represents determines who is going to be the speaker. Now, the PVP wanted to have the speakership, even though they do not control the parliament. Secondly, they want to control the committees. As far as I know, the 
committees are voted on by the members of parliament. The majority of members of parliament say that this is what we're going to have, the, the Ways and Means Committee and all these other committees. And the majority party or parties in parliament always controls those committees. The PVP government does not want that. Because if, if you remove that from parliament, then you remove from parliament the ability to go and investigate. Have oversight. There's no oversight. oversight. There's no oversight. So we back to what the PVP was doing before. And in the essence, the parliament should, they're asking the APNU and the AFC to rubber stamp what they have done as they have done, been doing in the past when they have the majority. Now, the question of proportionality did not come into play. All along, the PVP was, was, had the majorities. That did not come into play until they discover that the will of the people was, after the 28th of November was that we're going to have divided government. And we're going to have divided government with oversight, in which you have the AFC now holds the balance of power. Now, we of the AFC have made it quite clear. Develop that a bit more. What do you mean the AFC, the Alliance for Change, holds a balance of power? Well, unless the PVP, the, the, P, the PNC or the APNU, aligns with the government to pass legislation. Like the budget. Like the budget and to the other committees, it's not going to happen. So there has been an alliance between the AFC and the APNU. And we are saying that, look, we want to bring back... There's a parliamentary alliance. A parliamentary alliance. We want to bring back constitutional government in which parliament remains supreme. So what is going to happen? Errol says there's no constitutional crisis. But they, what will happen if the opposition parties do not approve the budget? What will happen? Wouldn't there be a constitutional crisis? Where, do you all believe that a snap election could resolve this problem? That we need the people to elect a government uh, outrightly in both parliament and the presidency, or we need this to continue? Paul, so, recently, recently, the United States, here in the United States, there was a shutdown of the government when the Congress and the White House could not agree on a budget. On the Gingrich. Right, okay. No, recently also. I mean, oh, there was yeah. a threat of that also. There was a threat. Th that, wasn't, that, no, wasn't there, there, there was always, that, there is always a threat of that when you have divided government like this. When I say there is no constitutional crisis, I mean with Gingrich and with Clinton or whomever was the president at the time, they were able to work out consensus on the budget eventually. And I am saying that the, the opposition forces and the government, they will come to a resolution. This government will not be shut down. Okay? Now, in the short run, these are two hard-headed movements. And they are trying you know, to practice one-upmanship and all of that. But eventually, this is something that's new to them. Guyana has never had this kind of division in government before. And they are trying to reconcile to the new realities, the new dispensation. And I am saying to you that they will resolve it. It might not be exactly what the PPP wants or APNO wants or AFC wants, but they will resolve it. I think they more will have to be uh, forced to resolve uh, it in the sense that the, the PPP government has to face the new reality that they do not control parliament, they control the executive, and they have to come to parliament to have ratification of their policies. So they'll be forced to come and say, let's sit down and talk. You can't yeah. equate the United States era mm -hmm. with, no. the, with Guyana, yeah. because it's, it's, this country has centuries of people understand, uh, understanding the, the rule of law. Well, we are now developing that. But I think what he was saying, I don't think he was equating it in the sense that a guy has all the civil society institutions. I think what he was saying was, there's no constitutional crisis because the constitution really allows for the situation to evolve as it has. As what it is, has. What, what actually that has happened, which is healthy for Guyana, is that, as you're going to say, it compels for the first time mm -hmm. in the political mm -hmm. history of Guyana, That's right. the executive and the legislative to what now... What about the Caribbean? In the Caribbean, it happens all the time. Let me just tell you. In, you know, I wanted to make a comment about your, your perception that in Westminster, things are such that people fight all the time. I will tell you, in the history of Dominica, Barbados, Jamaica, there are many times where government opposition have gotten together on matters of the national interest. Right. And have come together to do commissions of inquiry, 
where the government has four That's members, right. the opposition has three, and then one independent. So it is a misconception to think that because of the Westminster model of government and opposition that they are always at loggerheads. There's a great degree of, of amity that develops. There's a great degree of give and take that has developed. There's a great degree of procedural process that has really fostered the spirit of consensus building and partnership. And it's healthy for Guyana that the government now has to confront that yes, reality, reality that yes, it is right. not in any way, shape or form, an authoritarian leviathan that can willy-nilly, unilaterally make decisions, that it must sit down with other um, components of the social construct and work out arrangements with regard to the public purse. And that is what's going to happen, and I think it's a very healthy development. So, so Dominican, you, 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 you're looking at Guyana with optimism that, yeah, that, that is good for, it's for good, good governance. It's very healthy, very healthy. Well, gentlemen, I, I, I want to thank you all for being here today. Evidently, we are just touching on the surface <laughs> of this issue. Uh, it's, uh, the constitution of Guyana is complex. It's a country divided into ten regions. And the, the, the system that has been established there for a population of less than a million people is quite complex and very different from the Caribbean. So gentlemen, thank you very much for being on the program. Uh, the situation in Guyana, uh, the constitution situation is very complex and different, as you all are aware, from the English-speaking Caribbean, because we have less than a million people, but we have 10 regions, and there are kind of multiple voting going on. And I don't know if it's a too complicated system, even for the people of Guyana, why we don't have a more straightforward system. But evidently, uh, it seems to me that, from what you all have been saying, that there is going to be great need for a new political culture. Is that correct? That, uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. New form absolutely. Of, uh, yeah. of governance. Compromise, <coughs> consensus building. Consensus building. Yeah. And Transparency I think it, and government. Yeah, and I think it will go, accountability. It seems that, like it will go beyond uh, what has existed what exists so far in the English-speaking mm -hmm. Caribbean, even beyond the Westminster model and the, some of the positive points that you have raised, Gabriel, concerning uh, the experience in Jamaica and Dominica yeah. and so forth in a kind of consensus kind of politics. Yes. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being on the show today. Your, your comments were very insightful, and we have a far way to go to grasping the constitution of Ghana. For those of you who would like to know more about the Constitution of Guyana and how it's different from the other English-speaking Caribbean countries, I recommend very strongly a book that I have read. It's called The Constitution of Guyana, and it's produced as part of the transition series at the University of Guyana in the Institute of Development Studies. Until next time, I am Paul Nero Tennessee for Carib Nation. Thank you.